Tonight on John E's Prime, Securities and Exchange Commission revokes licenses of 53 fund management companies in a cleanup similar to what happened in the banking sector. The affected, the affected companies include All Time Capital, First Bank Financial Services, and Black Shield Fund Management, formerly Gold Coast Fund Management. You may want to know which other companies made it onto the list and what you should do if you have funds in any of the companies. Family of senior police officer detained in connection with the alleged coup plot to now have more access to him as judge orders his transfer to police cell from BNI custody. The Kanishi District Court hearing the matter, however, dismissed challenges to its jurisdiction. ACP Dr. Agojo has meanwhile been interdicted by the police service who will tell you why. And an attempt by management of the electricity company of Ghana to reintegrate former members of staff who left to join PDS during the takeover is being resisted by the staff who stayed on, who say promotions they earned would be in jeopardy. I'm Israel Lai and Joy News Prime comes to you live from the Joy News studio at Coco Mlimli here in Accra with digital address GA0992539. Stay tuned in. Now, very first story, ACP Dr. Benjamin Agojo, the senior police officer arrested in connection with an alleged coup plot, will tonight likely sleep in a cell at the Ministries Police Station instead of the BNI facility where he's been detained since Monday. This was after the Kanishi District Court hearing the case on Friday dismissed a challenge to his jurisdiction. The court, presided over by Eleanor Kakra Bans Botre, however, directed that his family be allowed to visit him. ACP Dr. Agojo was detained by the BNI after honoring an invitation to assist in investigations for his involvement, over his involvement in the alleged plot to destabilize the presidency. Komladum was in court and reports the suspect showed up amidst heavy security and this time without his police uniform, which sparked controversy on Wednesday. Lawyers of a police chief, ACP Benjamin Agojo, had challenged the jurisdiction of a Kanishi district court hearing the alleged treason case against their client. According to them, the charge of treason, which is a first-degree felony, does not fall under the ambit of a district court. The lawyers also raised issues of poor handling by BNI officials of their clients while he was in custody. Lead lawyer for Dr. Agojo, Martin Pebu, told the court family and relations were denied access to the police officer while he was in BNI cells, pleading the court remands him in police custody. The court presided over by Eleanor Kakrabans Boche dismissed the case by lawyers challenging the jurisdiction of a court to handle the matter. The magistrate described as unfounded opposition by the defense lawyers for the court to begin committal proceedings against the suspect. In her ruling, she said the district court is fully cloaked with the powers to deal with the matter and therefore directed the charge be read to the suspect to fast track the processes to forward the docket to the attorney general's office for advice. Lead counsel for the former director of transformation office of the police told the court some foreign persons were seen in the suspect's room Friday morning where he was being held, leaving him uncomfortable. He pleaded with the court to move the suspect to the Nima police station while he seeks medical attention due to ill health. The magistrate ruled the suspect be remanded in the custody of the ministry's police to afford them the opportunity to seek medical attention at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital or the police hospital. Madame Kakra Bans Boche also directed the police to make the suspect available to his family between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. each day. Victor Kojuga Daudu, who represents some seven persons, including Chief Executive Officer of the Citadel Hospital, Dr. Yao Makpalm, accused of plotting to destabilize the state, spoke to journalists right after proceedings. Our law says that when you commit an offense, there's something we say indictable. That means that it's a severe offense, the punishment is great, is grave. So if it is grave, the district court would have to look at the bill of indictment. Bill of indictment is just that the statement made by the witnesses and all that the prosecution has will bring it before the district court. District court will look at it. It will not even take your plea. Then from there, the matter is transferred to the high court. So, but before doing that, it is the attorney general who will have to advise whether it can be done quickly, summarily, or you advise as to what should be done. Mm. So that's why the judge said that make sure the docket gets to attorney general. Attorney general advises, then the committal proceeding will start from mm. here. Mm. Then it goes to high court. 
where the proper trial mm. will start. Magistrate Eleanor Kakrabans Botre, before adjourning the case to November 20, said she was unimpressed by some utterances made by Dr. Agojo in the media after the last sitting. I have not committed any crime. I've done nothing wrong. I mean, we are, the president called upon us to be citizens. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when I express my opinion on a WhatsApp platform, unrelated to any alleged coup, nobody should bog me down. And I'll stand for this. She cautioned the suspect and his family to desist from speaking to the media while the case is ongoing, arguing it had the potential to cause tension and incite people. ACP Agojo was in court amidst heavy police deployment and without his police uniform, which sparked controversy at the last sitting. There were concerns from several quarters over the uniform matched with a UN beret and insignia. The senior police officer showed up sporting a fitting navy blue short-sleeved kaftan with a petite breast button on his top right-hand corner. Before he was led into the courtroom, he muttered a few words with two fingers raised in the air. He, however, exited the premises in silence, but with two fingers still raised in the air, drawing cheers and chants from friends, family and sympathizers who showed up. The very latest we're getting on the story is that ACP Dr. Ben Gojo has been interdicted by the police administration. Now, I have Malik Dabu, who's joined me here in the studio, and he's going to be telling us why. Malik, why is, uh, has ACP Dr. Benjamin uh, Agojo has been, been interdicted? Now, what our sources within the police service tell us is that normally when persons within the police service are facing criminal charges, such as uh, Dr. Agojo is facing, what they do is to interdict the person for 90 days because the police service regulation CR 76 is the enabling law that allows them to do this interdiction because they say that once the person cannot perform their functions at the ought to do within the police service then what they have to do is to interdict the person and they tell us that this is not the first time this is happening they interdicted the police officer who allegedly assaulted that woman at the Midland, Mad Midland savings, savings and Loans you know that matter was a heady discussion at the time Time. And at the time, they said that they, rel they relied on this same police service regulation, CI 76 of 2012. It was on 2012 that these uh, regulations were passed. It was on the basis of those regulations that they have interdicted him. What the law does not allow them to do is to dismiss him until the court hears the matter and makes a determination whether or not he's guilty. All right. The other issue that's come up uh, today has to do with the judge directing that ACP Agojo be moved from the BNI custody into the, to the ministry's police station. Now, compared to the conditions under which he is kept, even though he gets more access or the family gets more access to him at the ministry's police station, compared to the BNI, the conditions under which he was kept at the BNI, which, where would he have been better off? I think he's, he's found himself in, in the middle of the deep blue sea and a hard stone. Whilst he was at the BNIU, remember that his lawyers complained that access to him was completely curtailed and restricted. His family couldn't have access to him, which is the reason why we had information from the police top hierarchy that they were trying to create a liaison officer between him and the BNI and his family so that this liaison officer would, uh, would facilitate access to him. Now, the lawyers then applied that he should be moved to a police custody where they will have better access to him. The, 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 the judge has given that order, but that order has to be received by the lawyers in order that they can facilitate it. Now, the conditions at the BNI would have been better for him compared to the police Why service. Why so? That, it, that is because within the police service, they do not have secluded areas that are meant for senior police officers or police officers generally who are facing any criminal case or any criminal charges for which reason they have to be detained. Normally, they will put it in the same general cells with other suspected criminals. And given that this is a decorated police officer, he's an assistant commissioner of police, that's one of the highest ranks that one can attain in the police service. And given that they don't have a secluded, a secluded or a particular place where they can place him, they most likely will leave him in the same cells as the other suspects, which is um, which is not something the police may want to do. So the BNI would have been better for him because in that case he would be in a, in a much more comfortable place. But of course, 
access to that place too is restricted. So I think that the lawyers weighed the options and decided that access to him is more important to his family and his friends. Therefore, uh, he would deal with the inconvenience and have access to his family. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Malik Dabu, bringing us that update. But joining us on uh, by Skype now is security analyst, analyst Adam Bona. Thank you very much for making time to speak with us, uh, Mr. Adam Bona. And I'd like us to continue from where Malik left off, which has to do with where the ACP Dr. Benjamin Agojo would have to spend the next few days. That is, if the court order is eventually uh, handed over to the BNI to release him to the ministry's police station. Now, he ends up in the ministry's police station where he probably wouldn't have a bed uh, to lie on as happening or as pertains in most of the uh, police cells that we have, compared to where his condition, the conditions under which he will be kept at the BNI, where do you think it would have been preferred? Well, yes. Thank you. Uh, good evening to your viewers. Well, Israel, I would prefer the ministry's uh, police station. Uh, knowing how notorious uh, the BNI uh, have been in, in recent years, not just today, we've heard about a lot of stories. And so uh, I believe that Right, the uh, connection to Adam Bona has uh, been lost there, but we'll try and re-establish that connection with him. The other story we're following uh, this evening has to do with the uh, SEC revoking the license of 53 fund management companies. Let's return to uh, the connection to Adam Bona on Skype. Hello, Adam, uh, Mr. Bona. You were making the point earlier. Yes, what I was saying literally was that it would be safe to have him, I mean, if I were his lawyers, uh, just like they did, to have him in within the police uh, settings. The, the point is that if you say he has to be at the ministry's police station, I heard you say he wouldn't have a bed because they don't have single cell for, you know, suspects. I mean, every part of the police station is still in the police custody. And so uh, one cannot easily just conclude and say, uh, he's going to be locked up in the in the hard in the hard cell or on the hard and put on the hard floor. As far as I'm concerned, I think that uh, being at, at that station is far better than in in the BNI custody, Israel. All right, but the other issue that's come up has to do with his interdiction. He has apparently been interdicted, and at, uh, that's according to the police service regulations. What do you know about this interdiction? So I, I raised this issue the very day he was picked up, because with they, the police themselves, their own regulations, usually you would have to be, you have, they have their own regimental processes they take you, or judiciary, uh, judicial uh, processes they take you through if you are suspected to have committed a crime. And you, they will start by, you know, and require that interdicting you before you, you face a service inquiry, or... After facing a service inquiry, they would interdict you. If there is a need for you to be dismissed, you are dismissed. Depending on the severity of the rank, sorry, of the offense, you are then put before a civilian court. But in his case, we, I spoke about it, that, uh, you know what, uh, something was not normal because you have a serving police officer, senior police officer, who was being put before a civilian court without any interdiction at all. And so I think... Well, it's the right thing to do to interdict him so that uh, he's technically relieved of every police official duties. He goes to, you know, have his day in court. If he comes out clean, he's, you know, he gets back his work. But if something happens, assuming without saying that is going to be the case, uh, the, he's guilty, then the police service can then go on and decide what they want to do with him. But at the moment, what the, the decision the police have taken in terms of his interdiction this is what i was expecting to have happened the very day he was picked up but i believe uh, better late than never all right thank you very much uh, adam bona adam bona is a security analyst and he has been sharing his thoughts with us on the interdiction of acp dr benjamin uh, gojo you're watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a break, but still ahead in the bulletin, the Securities and Exchange Commission has revoked the licenses of 53 
fund management companies in a cleanup similar to what happened in the banking sector. The affected companies include All Time Capital, First Bank Financial Services, and Black Shield Fund Management, formerly Gold Coast Fund Management. And you may want to know which other companies made it onto the list and what you should do if you have your funds in any of the companies. Stay tuned in. We'll be back in a bit. Now, the Securities and Exchange Commission has revoked the licenses of 53 fund management companies in a massive cleanup of the securities market, similar to what happened in the banking and microfinance industry. The affected companies include All Time Capital, First Bank Financial Services Limited, and Black Shield Fund Management, formerly Gold Coast Fund Management Limited. A statement released by SEC cited specific reasons for the revocation. I would uh, hold on with the specific reasons, uh, but give you a brief background to why the SEC has decided to take this decision. And it's if you look at the statement they have released, it states the Securities and Exchange Commission has, with effect from today, revoked the licenses of 53 fund management companies and uh, CNX A list for the companies. I'll take you through the companies in a bit. These actions were taken pursuant to Section 122, Section 2B uh, of the Securities Industry Act 2016, Act 929 or the Act, which authorizes the Securities and Exchange Commission to revoke the license of the market operator under any of the following circumstances, and they list the circumstances. I'll skip that and go to the consider page two of the statement. It says, the revocation of the licenses of the specified companies has become necessary as they have largely failed to return client funds, which remain locked up, and in a number of cases, they have even folded up the operations. Essentially, they have failed to perform their functions efficiently, honestly, and fairly, and in some cases are in continuing breach of the requirements under relevant securities laws, rules, or conditions, despite opportunities provided by, to them by the SEC within a reasonable period of time to resolve all regulatory breaches. The SEC has concluded after extensive engagement with these institutions that their continuous existence in the light of their conduct poses severe risks to the stability of the capital market and to the interest of investors. It continues, the SEC has taken this action in accordance with its mandate of protecting investors and the integrity of the capital market. The SEC and its authorized agents will secure the premises of the affected companies for further investigations under Section 26 of the Act. In addition, the SEC has notified the Registrar of Companies of the revocation of these licenses and has requested that the Registrar petitions the High Court to commence winding up proceedings against these companies under the Bodies Corporate Official Liquidations Act 1963, Act 180. The authorized agent of SEC and the liquidator, once appointed, will work together with the government to pay a capped amount, and this is quite important, the authorized agent of SEC and the liquidator, once appointed, will work together with the government to pay a capped amount to all affected custom investors of these firms in line with government's commitment to support the industry, sec securities industry and to provide some immediate relief to investors who are hurting because of their locked up funds. The outcome of the court process will inform the handling of assets, retrieval and liquidation to further sort out validated investor claims. So by per this statement or this aspect or this paragraph in the statement, the SEC is saying that a capped amount to, will be paid to all affected investors of these firms. But then the outcome of the court processes will inform the handling of assets retrieval and liquidation to further sort out validated investor claims. Now, this other paragraph is crucial. It says, by the close of business on Monday, the 11th of November, 2019, SEC, together with its authorized agent, will provide further details about the validation process and specific locations where investors can present their claims to be validated. In the interim, we urge all investors to remain calm, gather all receipts, statements and any other documentation required to their investment related to their investment with their affected institutions. I'd like to reiterate this point. It says, in the interim, we urge all investors to remain calm, 
gather all receipts, statements, and any other documentation related to the investment with the affected companies. And it concludes there is no need for any panic withdrawals of the firms whose licenses are intact and not on the revocation list. And a list of firms whose licenses have not been revoked can be found on the SEC website. So at this point, I'd want to, I'd want to take you through the listed uh, companies, the companies that have been affected. And there are two uh, uh, lists. The first one has to do with the list of fund managers who are not operating and whose licenses have been revoked. And it lists them as follows. Alpha Cap Limited. Beige Capital Asset Management Limited, Cambridge Capital Advisors Limited, EM Capital Limited, Energy Investments Limited, From From Capital Limited, Gold Rock Capital Management Limited, Heritage Securities Limited, formerly Future PIP Asset Management, Kamag Capital Limited, formerly Lifeline Asset Management, Cron Capital Limited, Mark Asset Limited, Man Capital Partners Limited, McCotley Capital Limited, McEllis Investments, Ghana Limited, Nickel Kinesbury Limited, SG Royal Capital Limited, Standard Securities Limited, formerly ASN Investments Limited, Tikure Cap Capital Limited, Ultimate Trust Fund Management Limited, Universal Capital Management Limited, and Western Capital Management Limited. So this list has to do with fund managers who are not operating and whose licenses have been revoked. Now, we have a second list, which has to do with list of fund managers who are operating and whose licenses have been revoked. And they include All Time Capital Limited, Apex Capital Partners, Axe Capital Limited, formerly United Asset Management, Black Shield Capital Management, formerly Gold Coast Fund Management, Brooks Asset Management Limited, Canal Capital Limited, Corporate Hills Investment Limited, Dow J's Investment Limited, First, First Bank Financial Services Limited, Frontline Capital Advisors Limited, Galaxy Capital Limited, Global Investment Bankers Limited, Gold Street Fund Management Limited, formerly Gold Street Investment Limited, Ideal Capital Partners Limited, Intermarket Asset Management Limited, formerly CDH Asset Management, Integrity Fund Management Limited, Crepa Capital Limited, Legacy Fund Management Limited, formerly Legacy Financial Services Limited, Liberty Asset Management Limited, Monarch Capital Limited, Mutual Integrity Asset Management Limited, Nest Capital Limited, Nordia Capital Limited, Omega Capital Limited, Procap Finance Limited, QFS Securities Limited, Sirius Capital Limited, Strategic Hedge Capital Limited, Supreme Trust Capital Limited, Uni Securities Ghana Limited, Utrack Capital Management Limited, and World Vision Financial Services Limited. All right, and the SEC has added a list of frequently asked questions. Do stay tuned in. We'll be taking a break to bring you business where, and business will be delving a lot more into this. But also, we'll be sharing with you the frequently asked uh, questions on the revocation of licenses of fund managers uh, by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And uh, later on in the bulletin, the other story we're following is that um, the, an attempt by management of the Electricity Company of Ghana to reintegrate former members of staff who left to join PDS during the takeover is being resisted by the staff who stayed on, who say promotions they end would be in jeopardy. You'd want to stay tuned in for that story. Stay tuned in, we'll be back with business in a bit. Welcome back to Joy News Prime and uh, moving on to other stories. There's confusion at the ECG as workers have vowed to resist plans by management to reverse recent staff promotions to make way for the reintegration of uh, members of staff who left their company now. 
according to the old staff, management wants to reverse promotions offered them after the exit of their colleagues. Several of them were promoted to fill vacancies left by ECG staff who decided to join PDS and management is seeking to revert to the status quo before the coming into force of the concessionaire in March 2019 as government's decision to terminate the agreement meant almost all workers inherited from the ECG had to return to uh, the ECG or inherited from PDS had to return to ECG. Uh, Joy, News is, uh, New, Joy News editor Fred Smith monitored events at the ECG headquarters earlier today. Well, for close to an hour, there was a hold-up. The, the, the workers were supposed to have a meeting with management, but there was a hold-up because some of the leadership of those who left ECG to PDS mm -hmm. and are now returning were present at the meeting and they did not want that to happen. And so they asked that they excuse them so that this meeting takes place. Now, the purpose for the meeting itself was to address rumors they've heard that management intends to reverse recent promotions they've given them. You know, uh, when PDS took over ECG in March, vacancies were there that needed to be filled. So the ECG workers who did not move were those who applied for these vacancies, these positions, and subsequently got the job. Mm -hmm. Now, their colleagues who left to PDS are back and are asking for uh, are asking for them to you know go back to their previous positions so they can take up their the positions they held before the PDS deal and there, there's huge disagreement over this so how is ECG's management justifying this decision to basically demote those they recently promoted well the uh, per the letter from government which cancelled the PDS concession it said that we should assume that nothing happened. PDA, the concession did not happen at all. And so everything was reverting to previous positions post-March mm. when the deal started. And so any other thing that has happened in the organization, if the workers were working at ECG before PDS came, they have to go back. The challenge here is somebody would have invested a lot of emotion, a lot of resources, time, family decisions to occupy a new position. They actually applied for it, and so you'd have gone to justify. It takes a lot to do this. And so asking them to step down from the promoted the new position to a younger one, I mean, could you, many of us will hold parties and things to celebrate mm. if you are promoted at work. Indeed. And so all of these things have happened already, and you want them to revert to their previous. How is that going to happen? Mm. They have to accept salary cuts. How, how are you going to manage that? And uh, the, the ECG workers are saying no. And mind you, the difficulty for management here is that those who are returning are in excess of 6,000. Those who remained are a little over 100, say 120 thereabouts. So they are the ones who held the fort for ECG whilst their colleagues went exploring mm. at PDS. And they're saying no. If you've come back, start again. Us on phone now to delve more into these issues is Ben Arthur. He's a labor consultant. Thank you very much for speaking with us, Mr. Arthur. Now, we here we're faced with a situation or management of uh, ECG is faced with a situation where there were some workers who were with ECG when PDS took over, the workers were moved or transferred to PDS. Now, when the workers left, the workers who stayed behind were promoted or they gained promotions. These workers who went to PDS are now back at ECG and they're expecting that they revert to the status quo and revert to the positions they held before the takeover. How do you deal with a challenge like this? Thank you and uh, good evening to all your viewers as well. In fact, I must say that the PDS who by magnanimity, I'm calling it magnanimity, you know, are being, you know, giving positions back to their former entity, uh, do not have any labor or employment rights as to be in statement as to more so to their former positions. 
normally for practice and what the labor law provides, if there's an amalgamation or if there's a takeover or there's even a change in structure, definitely it necessitates some kind of layoffs or modification of terms and conditions. And in this case, what it means is that your your contract, your legal relationship with ECG has been severe. And for social protection purposes, you are being accepted back. Your colleagues who stay and have had promotion, there's no no fault of theirs. And it will be very difficult for any employer, especially in the set of ECG, to say that, look, the ones who stayed on for which reason we have promoted or whatever performance indicators they use, they have they have been promoted. It is very difficult to go and tell those people that look, your former guys are in. Please step down and let them take your place. That will be very, very, you know, injurious to their labor or let's say economic rights as far as employment relations is concerned. So it is not something that I think they'll be able to fight and win. Uh, what is important is to have the acceptance back and to work. And I think that is a good thing that ECB you know, has agreed to accept to take them back. Yes. Apart from that, ECB also has a right. There is a right of an employer to hire anybody of his or her choice. So ECG on the alternative could have gone onto the open market or re-advertise all those positions and say that look everybody apply and it, the onus is for me to interview and to choose. All right, uh, Mr. Arthur, but that's where the challenge is because ECG doesn't have the luxury of laying off all the staff who are coming from PDS to say that they should reapply because work has to go on and they have to take care of. Uh, customer complaints and fix issues, challenges in the in the sector. So ECG doesn't have that luxury. And again, to make the situation a lot more complicated or making the situation a lot more complicated is the fact that government owns ECG and government says, I've terminated the agreement with PDS. ECG, take back the workers. It leaves ECG or the management of ECG very little option. Hello? Yes. Yeah, there, there are options, but if you if you understood me, what I thought to say is that within the right of an employer, that includes the right to hire and to fire. And I'm saying that the ECG could have had that option of saying that I'm advertising the position. And anybody who applies, depending on your experience level, you could have been absorbed or rejected. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that the workers must accept this uh, magnanimity. Of course, government owns ECG. It's a public corporation, but you must also understand that it's a limited liability company on its own, just like any other firm, except that the, the shareholders are from the public sector. That's the only difference. In, in this case, I think that the workers need to sit down with management and iron it out. But as whether you should be giving back exactly your former position or not, what I'm trying to say is that that would be a very difficult thing to implement. All right. Especially when people are occupying such positions and they are doing so on merit. All right. So as far as you're concerned, Mr. Arthur, the workers who stayed on and who did not join PDS have the upper hand. They, they, they deserve it, not just to even say upper hand. They deserve their position. All right, thank you very much. Uh, ben Arthur is a labor consultant and he has been speaking on the issue of the ECG uh, workers and there is some confusion there because staff who stayed on during the takeover by PDS are resisting what they say is a move to make them worse off with the return of their former colleagues to the company. Moving on to other stories, no road, no vote. Those are words of cocoa farmers, residents, and traditional leaders as Samra Boy in the Amenfi West District of the Western Region. They poured onto the streets, protesting the bad nature of roads in their district. Clad in red, residents burnt car tires, chanted war songs, and blocked the main Samra Boy Pristia Road, leaving several commuters stranded. Not only this government, but the previous government, all of them, they have lived this, this area alone. And we, the Samar Boy area, we are, we are the leaders.
leading co uh, cocoa producing in Ghana here. Almost eight years now, we are the leading cocoa producing for this country. And nothing has been done within our area. No good roads, no secondary schools. Even the secondary schools have been built, but up to date, it's in the bush. It becomes certain for animals. And the roads are bad to be done. The roads are bad. So, we are now here to demonstrate to show the government that we should come on our edge to make good use of the road for us. So what will happen after this demonstration? After this demonstration, we are giving our, I mean, all matters to the government. If the DC fails to come and collect our demands, we will find ourselves in a good show for next time to come. Uh, yeah <laughs> The Western region has been Ghana's leading cocoa producer since 1984, but roads leading into the cocoa farms are in a terrible state. At least 14% of Ghana's cocoa cash comes from the Amenfi West District. The traditional leaders question whether cocoa roads announced by government are being constructed. Now, the John Ejikum Kufo Foundation is asking government to formulate a policy that will require public institutions, such as schools, to buy local rice. Speaking at the Ghana Rice Festival in Accra, Chief Executive Officer of the Foundation, Professor Bafo Ejimengduya, said it is troubling that despite the huge local capacity, the country continues to import rice to the tune of almost a billion dollars each year. There's more in the following report. The event, organized by the Kufour Foundation and the Ghana Rice Interprofessional Body, was designed to promote the consumption of Ghana rice. It's therefore called for a ban on rice importation to spare local production. Nana Ajay Aye, president of the Ghana Rice Interprofessional Body, outlined some of the challenges rice farmers face and says government must pay more attention to rice farmers. A special location for um, fertilizers during the subsidies season. We also plead to government to also help us, to also help us get or work with financial institutions to be able to um, get um, how do I put it? A soft what? A soft loans. Thank you, Prof. Soft loans or concessionary loans. Currently, we are borrowing at a rate of 30%, which is almost or near to impossible for farmers to um, do business. Currently, if I go to the market to borrow, I can, the best rate I can get is about 25%, which is impossible for me to do my business. So we are pleading to the financial institutions or government to do special location for us. Chief Director at the Ministry of Agriculture, Patrick Ankobia, says the ministry has positioned itself to support rice farmers, adding that the ministry is bringing in equipment, such as rice millers, to boost the processing of locally produced rice. Some action is being taken towards all these requests that you have made. Some action is being taken in that regard. Talk about mechanization. The minister, on behalf of government and the ministry, is bringing in equipment, machinery, including rice millers from India and Brazil and what have you. So 
I am very hopeful that that issue will be addressed. Now, if you talk about fertilizer distribution, yes, that also is an issue that I'm sure can be seriously looked at. We are aware of the problems with the distribution of fertilizer. But you see again, this is where we, we undermine our own efforts. So you all have a role to play, even as the necessary strategies and policies will be put in place. Professor Bafo Jandra says the foundation recognizes the hard work of rice farmers across the country and will continue to support them. We are working with the ministry and there's a consortium that the Kufo Foundation is sponsoring to promote local rice. We do that by first through the uh, Ghana uh, Rice Interprofessional Body. We have organized all the regions as you saw today, all the regions where rice is grown, we have the, the, their representatives here. We are going to ensure that they get the right inputs so they can increase their production. So ultimately, working with the whole value chain of rice production from farmers to distributors, we hope that within the shortest possible time, Ghana will become a self-sustaining rice uh, production country. Some rice farmers present exhibited the various Ghana rice on the market. If for Evans Chinri's report, for Joy News. Health Matters is brought to you by Camel Buy and Fly to Dubai promo. I got this. Say yes to life. Now, health practitioners in the Upper Wa East District of the Upper West Region are worried about the increasing rate of teenage pregnancies there. Statistics indicate the district has, in the last three years, recorded a total of 1,405 teenage pregnancies. Wa East District Director of the Ghana Health Service, Rukaya Wumaya, disclosed this at a news conference at Fumti. Join us as Upper West correspondent Rafik Salam reports. You may have heard of the story of Zinye and Sawobi, both in the Wa'is district of the Upper West region, where for 25 years, not a single girl has been able to complete junior high school. The highest educational level girls in these two communities are able to attain is junior high school too, before they are forcefully married off or due to pregnancy. Now listen and watch this chilling statistics that probably will send severs down your spine. For the last three years, a total of 1,415 girls in the Wa East District were pregnant. Wa East District Director of the Ghana Health Service, Rukaya Womnaya, made a disclosure at the Save Me the Press series at the district capital, Fancy. That notwithstanding, Rukai Omnaya said they are not resting on their hours but working with other agencies to deal with the high number of teenage pregnancies in the district. What is the district chief executive, Moses Jotie, enumerated some projects embarked on by the assembly? It doesn't mean that the contractors or the temp dams have been abandoned. We, it is the season that determines. So now that we are going into the dry season, the rains will not disturb. We are going to have our 10 dams in the district. Last two or three weeks, we have the officials who came here from uh, Ghana Highways Authority, and they took measures in all the roads. And you know, it is a process. It isn't that uh, you just go and mold blocks and start building. They are now going to, uh, taking the uh, this in the processes of getting the township roads worked on. So it is not anything that the president has mentioned and ran away. No. Deputy Apostle Minister Amiruchine Isaku also spoke about the implementation of the free senior high school policy. A little over 2,000 students have benefited from the free SHS in the two schools located 
in the Far East. What that means is that the cost that our parents should have been paying for these over 2,000 students, of let's say 1,800 cities per student, as school fees, has been absorbed by government, making it easier for them. And I believe the money that should have been paid for these over 2,000 students to be in secondary school is now savings in the pockets of their parents that they can direct to other channels to improve their lives. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam, Fonsi. Very much, and that's it for the bulletin. I'm Israel. Thank you very much for watching. You have a good night. Thank <music> you.